Hi, welcome everyone. This is panel nine, Products, Appliances, ICT. My name is Eva Geilinger and I'm co-leading this panel together with Thomas Goetz. The upcoming session is called Products, Technologies and Policy Implications 2. And we will see some interesting findings about the new revised EU energy label and the efficiency classes that are available on the market. And we will hear about commercial appliances and how standards and labeling are progressing there. Before we start, I wanna quickly say to the live listeners, please post your questions in the WUFA um, as soon as you can during the presentations already so we can answer as many as possible of your questions because we have five minutes or less. So then let's jump into the first presentation. This is Karsten Schischke speaking. Um, Karsten is group manager at Fraunhofer ISM's Department of Environmental and Reliability Engineering in Germany. He has over 20 years of experience in applied research on sustainability of electronics. He has been involved involved in various eco-design preparatory studies. He also coordinates large European research and innovation projects in the FP7 and Horizon 2020 program and coordinates a working group on environmental product policies like um, restriction of hazardous substances or REACH or others. Um, whose member institutions include German authorities, test labs, federations, and manufacturers. He holds a diploma of engineering in environmental engineering from the Technical University in Berlin. So let's hear the presentation. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Carsten Schischke. I'm with Fraunhofer ICM. And uh, I want to talk about uh, the how the market looks like uh, now with uh, the introduction of a rescaled energy efficiency label on the European market, which took effect uh, then March this year. My background is at the front of ICM, where I'm leading a, a research group. Uh, we are working on, on eco design for industry to implement uh, eco design solutions, to develop eco design solutions in the field of microelectronics and electronic devices, ICT, um, but also supporting the European Commission in preparatory studies under the Ecodesign Directive. Uh, life cycle assessments are now and then uh, the tool to apply uh, to figure out what, what really matters. Um, more and more material efficiency aspects. Um, actually, half of our department uh, works on reliability issues, so which is uh, then really super important. Uh, for the upcoming uh, material efficiency focus under the eco design regulation. But let's talk about energy today. A few weeks ago, my daughter approached me and uh, told me, well, her flatmates, uh, they uh, want to buy a new TV set, uh, and what they have in mind is a class G TV set, but well, what, what, what do you say about that? Is that uh, is this really a good one? Well, and I think about that, I will tell you in a minute. Because uh, I crunched some statistics to get a reply. New, uh, new label designs have been introduced uh, in March uh, this year on the European market uh, for really a bunch of um, devices, uh, appliances, mainly uh, li lighting equipment uh, coming later this year. Why new labels? Because until recently, products were available only or mostly in the top classes. And then it was tricky because what constitutes a top class was different for different product groups. So for some, the top class was class A, for others, A triple plus. So for the consumer, this has been pretty confusing. Is an A class device really a good one? What is the approach? How to recalibrate such kind of 
labels. First of all, returning to the good old scale A to G. So, and this for all products. And then the intention is to uh, leave uh, the top class empty, to incentivize your technology progress, to leave room for such kind of developments, uh, but also to provide uh, regulatory stability so that you don't have to touch again uh, the scale any soon um, for a, a rescaling again, so maybe in 10 years, something like this uh, is what the regulator has in mind and just let the move, market move as intended. What was the intention? This here is not real statistics, this has been the plan, the forecast based on prognosed technology developments uh, regarding electronic displays. So it's the introduction of the label, like 21, QG devices, uh, some more F and E class, but in particular uh, the top performing classes B and A empty for now. Then class G vanishing over time and class B entering the scene, class A according to this forecast only in 2026. And this is how the market should move. Where to get uh, the data from? Actually, um, my first plan was uh, to analyze the data in the new April product database, um, which has been introduced uh, then with the revision of the energy efficiency regulation uh, as well. And where you can get uh, the data from uh, right now is uh, you can scan the QR code you'll find on uh, the label. Uh, just give it a try. If you, if you have a smartphone with you right now, uh, just uh, scan the QR code uh, you find here and you will see where you will end up. I will tell you, you end up at the product entry of this very product. You have no choice to compare it with another product. You have uh, no choice to search for a product uh, for which you don't have uh, uh, the label and the QR code in front of you. Um, you cannot uh, check uh, what might be uh, the best performing product uh, in the product segment uh, you're looking for. So this is, um, well, not really satisfying here. Um, and this might change uh, then uh, in uh, the coming months. Uh, so there's uh, such kind of um, announcement uh, that maybe by end of this year or early 2022, um, such features might be available and this is why I asked then the organizers of the summer study here maybe to uh, postpone uh, the conference into the winter but uh, they refused so I had to come up with a plan B and this is now my plan B and uh, the data on which the following statistics uh, are based. Uh, I had a look at uh, price comparison portals. Um, such portals provide an pretty good overview. My assumption was it should be almost complete and representative. I checked now in the meantime two such price portals um, referring to the German market only. Um, so I, I really would love to compare this uh, with some other markets. So if you're based in other markets and um, want to do a similar parallel exercise, it would be super interesting to see uh, what are the differences uh, for various countries uh, within the European Union. Um, and be aware the statistics are then per model, not per market share actually. So the sales figures do not play a role in the following statistics. You still might find old labels um, because uh, this is still legally okay. Um, if you put uh, products on the market, uh, which are still in retail now, but put them on the market before March of this year, uh, they are still allowed via the old label. That I do then, I combine the search features to come up with the statistics for the various product groups. Let's talk about electronic displays first. Here about television sets and monitors, leaving aside signage displays, which are also covered by this product group. And here the statistics are really not as intended. So for TV sets, more than 70% are now in class G. 
And this here is actually then already updated data. I took into account here then uh, already uh, monitors, which you will not find um, in a quantitative um, evaluation in, in the paper. So this is then here new data. It, it looks a bit better for these monitors. So here the market um, tends uh, to populate better, the better energy efficiency classes. You even might be lucky to find the B class monitor, um, C and D. Not uh, very popular for, for monitors here. Um, all these criteria are not met. Uh, e, F, and G still representing some monitors as well. Uh, the vast majority of the market here. Uh, having in mind uh, that uh, there will be a more ambitious legislation um, kicking in in 2023, ecodesign regulation with the next tier, banning class G, uh, displays largely. This will be really challenging here for, for the market. So obviously something went wrong here with uh, the calibration with the formula opposed. Um, not as intended. So uh, this will be really a very tricky uh, point in time if in less than two years from now the market will really need uh, the uh, class F at large. So, and this is how it looks uh, then for the various uh, television set sizes. And this uh, indeed an intended effect, what you can see here. Larger display sizes perform worse in terms of energy efficiency. So, and if you go for really the large TV sets, you almost have no other choice than class G if you're looking for a TV set 49 inches or larger. So, and with such a kind of finding, well, the, the um, answer to my daughter is also uh, pretty clear. So, somehow, well, class G. You almost have no other choice, no other, no other chance to find anything else than a class G in these uh, marked uh, segments. So have a closer look at the energy efficiency or energy consumption stated on the label. Um, make comparison based on this uh, to figure out uh, which ones in class G are then uh, really the, the better ones. Um, and uh, this is uh, the way you should look at uh, these products. Um, but if you really find an E or F class device, you well, all that online, figure it out um, on a shop floor, you might really have trouble to find uh, such kind of devices uh, if you're in a particular shop. Now dishwashers. Here, um, the scale is much better used, uh, better spread across uh, the energy efficiency classes although class G is almost obsolete, um, and uh, equidesign requirements from 2024 onwards will require uh, that uh, devices, dishwashers correspond rather to class E and better. So this is already largely met by the market. Yeah, another interesting um, dimension of these statistics, looking at the distinction for price. So the various price ranges. So if you're looking really for a rather low cost dishwasher, you will not find a good energy efficiency class. So up to 300 euros, no way of finding even a B class uh, dishwasher. So if you really want an energy efficient one, then you have to go to the uh, upper price segments uh, and really a class B dishwasher as of today is in the segment 700 euros or above. Finally, washing machines. And here the market again looks completely different. So class A is not empty. By far it's not. So, but it's supposed to be. Actually 18% of uh, the models are in the top class A already right now as the label is introduced. And if you aggregate A, B, C, and D, it's 78% uh, in total. Class G is obsolete right from the beginning. Also here, more ambitious requirements will kick in uh, in 2024. 
um, most of the washing machines uh, should be in class B or better than, but this requirement is already largely met. Only 3% do not meet this requirement right now. Um, so this is not very well calibrated. And But it's, it's worthwhile to look at uh, some differences uh, when it comes to individual technical parameters. Here you see it then uh, for the capacity of the washing machine. Uh, but here, if you're looking for uh, a larger washing machine, uh, then 50% of the market is already A or B class. Which brings us to the conclusions here. The calibration of the A to G scale works really as intended for dishwashers. Well done. But seems to be too strict for television sets. So there are really major innovations in the market will be needed to meet uh, the 2023 design requirements. In particular, that's what you read in the paper, uh, the more advanced technologies, QLED, OLED uh, technologies, um, they are not there yet. So th they are almost exclusively in class G, which will be banned then uh, in less than two years from now. So this will be, will be really a challenge for further innovation in very short, uh, uh, short time. And the recalibrated uh, scale is not ambitious enough for washing machines. So the, the criteria for next revision of the energy classes are almost met already right today. So with this, what shall we tell the consumers? So go for a class E TV set. That's really great. Class C if you want to go for a dishwasher and class A for a washing machine. But even among washing machines, I really strongly recommend uh, to look at the details to figure out uh, which one among the class E devices is really among the better performing ones. So, and all this is still, and or again, very confusing and requires proper communication. Maybe even more confusing than when material efficiency criteria enter also the energy label. And this is here a draft from the ongoing work on a potential label. Uh, for smartphones and tablet computers. So some more durability requirements uh, than making it onto the label, potentially, draft by now. And to communicate this uh, correctly here, if we already have problems with uh, getting the scale right on the energy efficiency, is then tricky. So with this, thanks for your attention and I'm looking forward to our discussion right now. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, very interesting results, really. We have only two minutes for discussion. Maybe we can discuss more at the end of the session. Um, there is Kreitz right that perhaps there is a link between the football event starting this week um, to the TVs. And Torres Denfeld, okay, these are remarks more, not questions. Um, um, points to a Horizon 2020 project, label 2020. Uh, introduces in June or July 2021, a web application that uses API with the April product database and consumers can compare um, costs. You want to say something to this? Uh, to the uh, Euro Championship? Yeah, maybe. Uh, no, um, but to the other one, um, well, if uh, there's no API released from the European Commission, as far as, as I know, so if uh, they manage in the uh, Label 2020 project to get hold of the April data, which is publicly available uh, as such uh, in another way, so and um, there are web crawling opportunities, etc., to get hold of uh, the data, uh, then this uh, actually would, would be perfect because such kind of search uh, functions uh, really helps tremendously for the user. Just having the label at the shop floor um, and scanning it and uh, being forwarded to exactly the same uh, information then in the database doesn't really help. So searching, sorting, figuring out um, upfront uh, which, uh, what kind of product I want to buy is, uh, would be a really a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. And Jean-Sebastien Brock asks, 
so do you think the G-label TVs will have huge sales before 2023 or promotions? Might be, um, although the point is not actually at, at the retailer. If uh, the devices are already in the stock of the retailers, they are already considered put on the market. Uh, so th there will be still a period when they are still allowed after uh, the, the deadline uh, then to, to sell these uh, further. So this uh, should be okay. But um, of course, uh, further imports to the European market, maybe before the deadline, um, we might see this. Let's see. So I see more questions coming in, but let's move those to the end of the session because we have uh, three presentations and that leaves us some more time at the end. Um, so thank you so much, Karsten, and we'll move on to the next presentation. Um, we'll see the recording of Mike Hip for this one. Uh, and we have then Eric Bush um, here to answer questions. Uh, so Mike Hepp is an energy efficiency specialist who works um, at Top 10 in Switzerland. And Eric is the president of uh, the Top 10 International Group and CEO of Top 10 in Switzerland. Um, so he has more than 20 years of experience in the management of large national and international projects, in particular in the Horizon 2020 program and various rebate programs in Switzerland. And okay, this goes for Mike and Eric. Uh, their focus is on energy efficient appliances and supporting market transformation and they work in long-term collaborations with the Swiss government, electrical utilities, cities, environmental and consumer organizations, testing institutes, retailers and manufacturers. Um, so let's hear the presentation. Hello, my name is Maike Hepp, and today I'm going to be talking about energy regulations, transferring lessons from household to commercial appliances. I work for the project Top 10, which is an online platform showing the most efficient and environmentally friendly products on the market. Out of our 70 product categories, 11 categories cover professional and commercial refrigeration appliances saving investors time and money by presenting only the best available technologies on the market. Energy labeling and eco-design regulations for household appliances have been a success story in Europe. However, for similar professional appliances on the business-to-business -business market, similar regulations were long prevented through arguments like saying that um, efficiency is technologically not possible or that it's unsafe for the refrigerated content or that it's uh, too expensive, that uh, the market and businesses relying on these products might collapse. The first label for professional refrigeration appliances came into effect in 2016, so 22 years after the first energy label for household appliances. It covers professional refrigerated storage cabinets that are used in professional kitchens. There have not been any resulting safety or price issues on the market. This year in March, energy regulation for commercial display appliances with direct sales function followed. This covers supermarket refrigeration and freezing cabinets, refrigerated vending machines, beverage coolers and ice cream freezers. The 2016 label for storage refrigerators has triggered a significant market transformation. The graph shows the development of best available technologies over five years. In the category counter refrigerators, first A plus models entered the market less than a year after the label came into effect. For one door refrigerators, within four years, 34 class A models by 17 different manufacturers became available on the European market. Even for two door refrigerators, the number of class A and B models on the market are slowly increasing. For storage freezers, no a models are yet, are yet available on the market, and Class A models are rare as well. But for all of them, a steady increase of models in Classes B, C or D can be observed since 2016. 
During this time, data availability increased as well, though it took a few years after the introduction of the label until most products were labeled. The regulation for display refrigerators is fairly new. The policy process was delayed several times and only seriously started up again in 2018. The market data reflects this. While the changes in available bed models are very moderate before this time, many changes can be seen since 2018, here for beverage coolers and ice cream freezers. Within only three years, a multitude of class C, B and even the first class A models entered the market. In Switzerland, the availability of such a large and inexpensive number of beverage coolers led to the setting of stricter maps for beverage coolers, with minimum energy efficiency index 80 instead of 100. For integral supermarket cabinets, a similar acceleration of market transformation can be observed since 2018. For the vertical cabinets, manufacturers went to much effort to have first Class A models available at the time the label came into effect. It speaks for the market and the low-hanging fruit and saving potential that even just the preparation for the label triggered such technological innovation. The first labels for commercial appliances have been implemented and the market has reacted to it spectacularly. But what does that mean for the differences in energy consumption between various models on the market? The new minimum energy performance requirements for most refrigerators with a direct sales function are set at energy efficiency index 100. We have already seen that several categories already reach class A and that is an energy efficiency index of less than 10, which means a saving potential of 90% energy efficiency index between worst and best products on the market. Let's now look at horizontal supermarket refrigerators. They are often open and contain convenience food. An efficient model easily saves 80% compared to an open model. But still, many supermarkets prefer open appliances because they see doors or lids as barriers that might prevent impulse purchases. Well, they needn't worry. Many recent studies show that there is a no long-term change in revenue. Without the cold feed effect of open refrigerators, where customers literally get cold feed and move on faster, consumers spend more time in front of the cabinet and end up buying the same amount. For beverage coolers, it is very similar. A top efficient model saves 75% compared to an open model that is compliant with the minimum energy performance uh, standards and still about 60% compared to an average market appliance. Though the initial purchase price of the efficient model is higher, the lifetime cost is only about half that of the inefficient open model. Beverage coolers and ice cream freezers are often purchased in bulk by large beverage and food companies who loan or rent the appliances to the vendors like uh, kiosks. That is sometimes a bit of a conflict when one party buys the appliances and the other pays the electricity bills. Now that we have seen how much innovation has taken place for commercial refrigerators, Let's see where they stand when compared to household refrigerators that have been regulated for about 25 years. We will compare a top efficient household refrigerator that was class A triple plus until March and that is now in the new label for household refrigerators class C with a class A storage refrigerator, so a product that is uh, very technologically similar to the household refrigerator. Now, we all know that the appliances are measured according to different test standards, one with and one without door opening sequence, and that the net volume is calculated a bit differently. But all in all, that should account for only about 30 to 50% higher energy consumption of the professional storage refrigerator that is shown here in orange, compared to the values for the household refrigerator that is shown in blue but the energy consumption is almost 150% higher. Still, this is a class A professional model, and we have seen in previous slides that just a few years ago, class C and D models were among the most efficient on the market for this category. 
We can conclude two things. One, storage refrigerators have the potential to be as efficient as household appliances, and a transfer of technologies is possible. After all, household refrigerators have been regulated for about 25 years, and professional refrigerators only for about six years. And the transformation of the market has reduced the difference between bad models of the two categories to a factor of 1.5. Very impressive for a highly effective policy. And uh, conclusion two, there are still significant saving potentials to be unlocked. If we take a look at the least efficient products currently allowed on the market for storage refrigerators, which is class E with an energy efficiency index of uh, 75 to 85, and the best one door refrigerators, which are class A, which for this category means an efficiency index between 15 and 25, that results in a span of 60% energy efficiency. The future minimum requirements will certainly help to realize this potential and manufacturers will continue to come up with technological innovations. So manufacturers have a huge variety of ways to make new models more efficient. Some of the most effective ones are commonly known. The compressor is one of the most important components of any refrigerator. The so-called variable speed compressor will not run on and off at full power, but is able to continuously adjust its level in order to match the required output. Comparing some supermarket refrigerators with the regular and the variable speed compressor, has shown that alone the change to a variable speed compressor can move the products up by one energy class. Insulation is a clear factor. The less cold is lost, the less energy needed to reproduce it. A form of insulation are double or triple glazing of doors and air curtains for display refrigerators. Remote system or water loop systems don't necessarily make the appliance in itself more efficient, but the waste heat can be used in other aspects of the market, increasing the overall efficiency of the building. Refrigerants with a low global warming potential are currently coming to the market in strong numbers due to the European FGAS regulation that uh, bans refrigerants with high global warming potentials and uh, they are often paired with other efficiency technologies. The most efficient models are often generally of good quality and tend to be somewhat more expensive to purchase than low efficiency products. In order to accelerate market transformation, rebate programs for the most efficient products can be used. In Switzerland, such programs have existed since 2014. So the idea is that each saved kilowatt hour should be cheaper than a purchased kilowatt hour. Looking at the results of the first two such Swiss rebate programs, the third one just started this year, this can be confirmed. In the first program, the purchase of almost 6,000 highly efficient products could be financially supported. In the second program, it was almost 11,000 such products. The cost effectiveness of the first program was at 2.2 cent per kilowatt hour and for the second at 1.5 cent per kilowatt hour significantly lower than the cost of one kilowatt hour to purchase. However, the effect of a rebate program goes further. It causes dealers and investors to ask manufacturers for more models that qualify for the rebate program and it increases competition between manufacturers. It also causes dealers to adjust their product range towards highly efficient products because they expect to sell more of them. This is called multiplier effect. The question is if all of these advantages developments could be extended to cover more product categories on the business to business market. The problem is often that it is difficult to get enough initial information to start a regulation. The EU has now started to look into several such categories like refrigerated medicine cabinets. A test standard exists in the form of DIN 58345 that tests the functionality and measures the energy consumption. Medicine cabinets are a good candidate because they are very similar in construction and technology to storage refrigerators. 
The main differences are that they have to be more precise with regards to the in internal temperature and contain an elaborate warning system. The recent Swiss study shows the efficiency data for refrigerated medicine cabinets. It shows that the saving potential of the medicine cabinet is about 455 kilowatt hours per year or more than 6,800 kilowatt hours over an estimated lifetime of 15 years. Models already on the market and listed on top 10 show that efficiency and product safety for medicine cabinets are very compatible. The number of products on the market is very high and increasing drastically in the current, current COVID-19 pandemic. The next logical step are energy labeling and eco-design regulations to realize the saving potential and finally provide data transparency. More categories will follow. To summarize the conclusions, energy regulations on the business-to-business -business market have proven to be highly effective. Significant market transformation has been triggered and saving potentials realized. The full potentials can be realized by increasing market surveillance. Technology transfer between categories is possible. Rebate programs are highly effective policy tools to boost market transformation. And further business-to-business -business categories are ready to be included in the scope, like refrigerated medicine cabinets. All in all, energy regulation on the business-to-business -business market give innovative manufacturers an edge, dealers a new sales argument, and investors a chance to make a truly informed decision. Thank you very much for your attention. The full report will be available for download on top10.eu slash documentation. All right, thank you for this presentation. So Eric, we have you here to answer questions. Um, do you wanna maybe say something? Uh, did you see anything um, de development of prices? Have the models in the good classes become more expensive? Uh, wait a second. Hello, here I am. What we have seen that the uh, prices have an extreme huge variety depending whether somebody is buying many pieces or only few pieces. So to see the development of prices is um, not that easy, but basically we have not seen at all that the prices have increased. It's rather a... Um, the, Manufacturers have to provide these products and then they have more or less the usual prices. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so how do you, do you have, can you uh, predict a little bit or guess um, how the whole market will move for these refrigerators with a sales function? Because uh, in the household fridges are pretty much the same, but with the um, display refrigerators, you actually have to make this move from open to closed cabinets if you want to get to the high efficiency models. So is, is it a difference how the whole market might move there? I think we have an absolute huge potential if, um shops move to the closed models with lids because this is something like the factor of four that they lose more energy than without lids so here we really have an extreme big saving potential and if they are we have closed models still there is a, another potential that they can be of a better technology so i think there will be a similar development, especially as the new label is extremely new only since this March that it starts. And what we have always seen is that if there is 
market transparency that the buyers can see what is the, the real energy consumption. This has a strong influence on the market. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I already see that the time uh, is so that we will move on, but again, we might have time in the end to discuss more questions. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. The third presentation um, we hear is by Nadia Gross. Nadia is a project leader at Top 10 Switzerland as well. Um, she researches energy efficient appliances and consults consumers, procurement specialists, and policymakers on Swiss and EU level. Her expertise includes implementation of subsidy programs and product testing. And previously to working at Top 10, Nadia was responsible for the energy management reporting of one of the largest retailers in Switzerland. And she has also worked at TIP Energy as an analyst, uh, modeling energy demand and developing sustainability concepts. So let's hear Nadia's presentation. Hello, welcome. This is Nadia Gross. I will do a presentation on energy efficiency labels for residential and commercial coffee makers. I will now give you a short introduction on the topics that I will cover. I will present to you what is top 10 and then we will go to the energy consumption of coffee makers. And straight after that, focusing on the residential coffee makers and the Swiss energy label that exists. And then we will go to commercial coffee makers. How are they different? Where are they similar? Why we uh, from top 10 focus on energy losses? And then we will present some conclusions as well. Top10.ch is an energy efficiency platform based in Switzerland. Uh, we present the best products in terms of energy efficiency, but also the environment and for performance overall. We present 70 product lists from a commercial and residential uh, sector, where we present over 8,000 products. The page is quite popular. We have half a million sessions per year and over 2 million paid views. This uh, site is also used as a basis for rebate programs on a national and local level. It was founded in Zurich in the year 2000. And me, in the meantime, we have over 19 countries worldwide that run set, the similar websites for their countries. Important to note is that the European platform has the website www.top10.eu. Here we present the best products available in the European Union. Now, without further ado, I would like to come to energy consumption of making coffee. These numbers are taken from the preparatory studies for the working plans. Uh, you can see that the residential coffee makers have a stock of about 100 million units with consuming about 17 terawatt hours per year. The, the annual sales are roughly 30 million units by the end of 2025. Now for commercial coffee makers, they are considerably less. However, it's still 6 million units consuming almost the same amount as all of the residential coffee makers. So you see it's 13.6 uh, terawatt hours per year and the sales are about 700,000 units by the end of 2025. So we are talking about quite a large amount of energy that is consumed after all, and it's worthwhile talking about coffee makers. Switzerland has taken a slightly different approach. Back in 2009, a voluntary energy label that looked very similar to the already existing energy labels in the household appliances was introduced. And uh, but as it was only voluntary, it happened that only the good machines, so from the A and the B categories, actually used the label to uh, present their machines as energy efficient. In the meantime, uh, 
the top 10 was involved in helping develop a new test testing method uh, that was discussed with manufacturers, so from the CECED, now called APLIA, and the FEA, which is the Swiss equivalent of uh, the Manufacturers Association for Household Appliances. Um, so after a lot of uh, sessions and discussions and testing, uh, this new method was introduced and presented to the Swiss officials, which eventually concluded in the introduction of the mandatory label with this new testing method that was developed earlier. However, um, and yet another method was tested, and Top 10 did some work here as well in comparing the different testing methods. So this resulted in a revision of the label in 2016, which is still the current label that we have now, which is based on the method EN 60661. And uh, it also adopts the European regulation on standby. That means there has to be an auto shut off after 30 minutes as the factory setting that cannot be changed by the user. This was uh, a very important factor that Top 10 also fought for because this is where a lot of the energy losses happen if the, sh if the machines are just running and keeping warm. So this was a huge success and it works really well. This is the Swiss energy label for residential coffee makers. As you can see, it looks very similar to the other energy labels that exist in the household area. And um, the energy consumption is shown for the annual consumption, but it is measured on a daily basis for each um, function on its own. So for example, for the production of coffee, production of espresso, but also for steaming milk. And it's uh, a variety of processes that is clearly defined how it has to be measured. Also the unproductive functions such as a cup warmer, the reheating of the water when the machine is still running, the rinsing and so on. They're all measured separately and in the end added up and multiplied by 365 days for the annual consumption. As a result from the introduction of the label, the energy consumption per year has dropped from 180 kilowatt hours in 2006 even below 50 kilowatt hours for energy efficient models nowadays. So now you can get models that uh, consume less than 30 kilowatt hours per year, which is a, is a huge success. As in general, for commercial appliances, also commercial coffee makers are only about starting to come into focus in the policy uh, in 2014, there was a preliminary study for Ecodesign Work Package 3 and consequently in 2016, the commercial coffee makers were dropped from the working plan 3 because the saving potentials were not shown as substantial enough. This year, 2021, the preliminary study for the Ecodesign Working Plan 4 has been presented here, a saving potential of 2.4 terawatt hours per year was presented. Now the discussion is ongoing, it is not decided yet, but uh, the commercial coffee makers have been dropped from the scope so far, but also some uh, propositions from stakeholders have been made to include them in the professional cooking appliances and not just drop them completely from the working plan. Also important to note is that at the moment there is an ongoing development of a new testing standard by Senelec that will be presented this year if all goes well and uh, hopefully next year uh, adopted and come into force. Now we have to ask ourselves what are the differences of residential and commercial coffee makers? In the end, it's just coffee. But the big difference is that the product variety is much larger for commercial machines. You don't only make coffee or espresso or maybe a tea, but you can combine all these uh, coffee varieties 
into more than 20, 30 products depending on the machine. So you have, for example, cold uh, latte macchiato. So that means you need to be able to produce cold foam. And uh, there's mixed drinks, so adding flavors. You can make tea and just hot milk, hot chocolate, and so on and so on. Also, one of the big differences is the speed of production. So while at home, you can take your time and uh, make one cup after the other. If you are at a restaurant or at a cantina or in an office even, you need to have the capacity to produce a larger number of cups when the demand is high. So for example, let's say you are in an office and then it's a coffee break in the morning or the lunch break in the afternoon when everyone is going at the same time those machines need to have a very large um, capacity to produce a lot of uh, drinks uh, at the same time even so that's our next point as well so these machines are built that they can simultaneously produce different types of beverages meaning on one side you can produce coffee on the other side you can have your tea water or you can steam at the same time meaning that you need more technology built in to be able to do this separately. Then you have another point uh, where you are in places with no, no staff. So for example, 24 hour offices, there you have to have machines that have a high um, level of automation. So there's no one required to attend to these machines at all the time, like you would do at home. <clears throat> One other big factor is the use of fresh milk. While at home you take the milk out of the fridge, steam it or fill it into something that goes directly into the machine and steams it there. Uh, if you are at the office or at a restaurant, this is not very feasible, so the fresh milk is always in the machine and needs to be refrigerated, of course. That also uh, consumes energy and is, is usually a larger amount of energy than when you would keep it in the fridge because those appliances are very small sometimes even just for a liter or two liters of milk up to maybe 10 or 15 liters for the big machines but it's still a much smaller volume than uh, a normal fridge of 200 liters Topten has decided to focus on the energy loss that is presented in the DINOM 18873-2. It focuses on the energy loss, that means everything that is not connected to producing a single cup of coffee. So the heating up of the machine, the keeping it ready and warm, rinsing, etc. And this is a very simple approach that uh, is effective over all types of machines. You can find the current product list on the link at the bottom on Topton EU. We focus on the energy losses. Uh, this is a measurement of a restaurant and the machine is running 24-7. The peaks show where uh, products are uh, consumed. So for example, you can see the consumption service staff arrives around 9.30 and take, uh, is drinking several beverages and then from 11 to 11 at night uh, the restaurant is actually open and customers are demanding coffees. But as we can see in the next slide that I will show you, the majority of the energy consumption is not actually from production of the coffees. If we sum up those consumptions, you can see only 9% are actually from a coffee purchase, so when a customer has uh, demanded a coffee, all the rest of the energy is lost in standby or as we call it energy losses during the day but also during the night. So managing those energy losses properly will really make an effect on the energy consumption of the machine overall. As a conclusion, we would propose to introduce the European energy label for residential coffee makers based on the same norm as for Switzerland. This is very easy because the Swiss energy label can be adapted just as it is. There needs to be no further testing and a lot of machines are already tested and labeled for the Swiss market. As for the commercial coffee makers, 
we would like to have MEPS as, for example, the standby uh, regulation that should be also adopted for commercial coffee machines. This can be also done by mandatory timetables for on and off settings or automatic shut off after the cleaning cycle, where still a manual um, cleaning cycle is necessary, as well as promotion of eco modes. That means reduce the keep warm temperature after uh, 15 minutes of inactivity. Already now, several manufacturers are doing this for the various types of machines. In addition, there could be a label for commercial coffee makers. That could be, again, an adaption from the Swiss label for residential coffee makers and then based in the future on the new testing standard that is currently being developed by Senelec. Or it could be a different label that is based on energy losses as I presented earlier on the DIM norm. As a next step, we propose that more data is needed to see if those testing norms that we presented are actually applicable for commercial coffee makers. That could be done by uh, an independent laboratory such as the VDE in Germany that is already doing a lot of tests for coffee makers as well for, as for some commercial coffee makers and they could very well judge if that is even possible to do for commercial coffee machines as well. In addition, we propose that energy efficiency of coffee makers needs to stay on the agenda of policymakers, manufacturers and also users. So keep talking about it and uh, don't forget that there, there's a lot of coffee machines out there, be it in the residential sector or in the commercial sector, and there's a lot of energy being just wasted away. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for this presentation, Nadia. Um, so have you gotten any feedback from the users or the buyers of commercial coffee machines? Are they interested in energy or not at all? Uh, we have had some feedback and uh, it, it differs a lot of who you speak to. Uh, for some of them, it gets more into the focus. So they are aware that uh, coffee machines are running uh, 24 seven often, and they, they are aware that this uses energy and they are interested in it, but uh, the, it's not yet at the, at the top of their uh, interest. So there's still a lot of other factors that c come into play when they think about buying coffee machines. So th there is really need for making it more prominent for buyers as well. Uh, that energy is a, should be a factor that needs to be considered when uh, new machines are bought. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so Carsten Schischke asks, a uh, label for residential coffee makers. Through your top 10 EU activities, do you know how the Swiss label leads to a better, more energy efficient market compared to other European markets that don't have the label? So that if I understand it correctly, how the Swiss label leads to a better market in the European level. So the influence of the Swiss label to the European market, is that the question? I think uh, does Switzerland, the Swiss market have more efficient residential coffee makers than other countries because of the label? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if I can answer this altogether, but I think as I have presented, you can really see how the energy consumption dropped. But uh, we also have to know that most of the manufacturers are uh, present in all of the markets. So if they produce uh, machines for the Swiss markets, they are not exclusively sold in Switzerland. So they are also available in, in other markets. I don't think that's, uh, that we have such an exclusive machines that are only available in Switzerland. So it's, it's difficult for me to tell how much uh, this has shifted compared to other markets. Most of the machines are available also in Europe. I would have to look at the numbers 
to see uh, if in Europe other models are being sold that that are less efficient. I don't know, Eric, if you want to add something to this. Maybe not. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> ah, um. There you go. <laughs> Sorry for the ambush, but maybe you have more infos on this. Um, on the first, um, we don't have market data. So if to answer the question whether the market is different in Switzerland and in other countries, we would need that we would buy market data from the, from the share of efficient appliances. And this would only be possible if in other countries also there would be the energy label. And secondly, I think that the influence of the energy label is on the one hand by the consumer, that if there is an energy label, it has an influence on the consumers. On the other hand, I think that manufacturers are motivated to bring better products on the market as there is an energy label in Switzerland and the same products are sold in Europe. So I think there is a also a strong European impact because all these machines have now a complete transparency on their consumption. All right, thank you. Um, so we, I think we take uh, a little bit of time. Uh, I'm looking through the comments uh, to, so I wanna open uh, for questions to any of the three speakers that we've heard. Um, and we can just discuss a little bit longer. Um, so Sophie Atali made two comments um, to find the best products and hence the best energy classes for each type of products. Most of the top 10 teams unfortunately not in Germany, have studied the market in March in their countries and have found the same conclusions. Um, I think this is to Karsten's uh, statistics that she says this. And uh, Karsten says yes <laughs> with his That's head. Good to know. <laughs> good to know. Mm -hmm. um, and another Comment by Sophie Atali. This shows that professional buyers, and I think this is in reaction to uh, Mike's presentation, uh, professional buyers are professionals in the product they buy, but not necessarily in the energy consumption. So mandatory product information and labels are useful for professional products and part of market transformation process also for other actors. Um, here is a question for Maike and Eric. Can you explain why the commercial coffee machines currently run for 24 hours? Is it a technical reason or just the ease of use or financially not interesting to shut down? Nadia, you want to answer? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, I think this is in referral to the graph that I showed. This was just a uh, an example measurement that we got, but uh, so this is not representative, but uh, also in discussions with uh, people in restaurants and so on, this is quite common that the machines run 24 seven. And this really is uh, for two reasons that we have found out that for, for one, the, a lot of times manufacturers still tell uh, their buyers that it is uh, the better way to do it that it has less strain on the machine parts and so on, which if you talk to them directly is, is not necessarily still true. So the, the, there is no reason from a technical point of view to keep the machines running 24 seven. Uh, it is however, sometimes used as an argument that it's just easier. So that you don't need a management uh, for making sure that your coffee machine is ready in the morning. However, there's also a lot of solutions already that 
people uh, use. So, so they use timers, for example, where they set uh, a, an automatic time in the morning that it preheats. So it is ready when they start their days if the machine doesn't have it built in already. So there are, are solutions and they, they work just fine. So there really is no reason to leave them running for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered the question. Uh, and then there's a question, sorry, I missed this one for so long. Uh, Katrin Graulich from Öko Institute would like to know from Karsten, um, do you know if there is a specific technology in washing machines to reach the A class? Um, I already replied in, in the chat. I actually don't know. We, we haven't had a look at the uh, technical issues um, and uh, reasoning for that. Um, I just in parallel uh, try to figure out um, there, there are at least uh, numerous manufacturers providing devices in uh, class A. Uh, so it doesn't seem to be a kind of proprietary uh, technology. Um, my impression is that the reason is that the temperatures in the washing machines, they do not need to be 40 degrees or 60 degrees or whatever. And the cleaning efficiency is high even with low temperatures. So I think they just go on lower temperatures. Could be. So although the, the test procedures, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, really require also a measurement of uh, the reach temperature within the laundry. Exactly. So there's, uh, I think, not too much room to maneuver to, uh, to go down with the temperatures without tweaking the tests uh, as such. Karsten, uh, how realistic is um, further efficiency class and innovation potential for TVs now so badly rated in the new label? Will they just stay in class G or can they move up? Well, th this is really hard to predict, uh, I, I, would, uh, I would say. Um, so I have another statistics uh, then in uh, the paper actually, that rather the, the newer technologies, uh, so QLED, uh, OLED technologies uh, displays um, come uh, even more prominently in the G class, so seem to rate uh, even, uh, even worse than just LED backlit um, uh, TVs. Um, so as, as of now, it rather seems to be challenging uh, in particular for, for the new technologies. But we had a similar story when uh, LEDs were introduced a long time ago where the, the manufacturers then claimed it's hard to predict how the technology will be, uh, develop and uh, will be careful with uh, predicting uh, too optimistic uh, changes in the market. Uh, but uh, then in, in the end, uh, the, the uh, trend in the market was uh, very uh, positive. Uh, actually with the introduction of uh, the energy label. Uh, so sometimes uh, technology or uh, regularly uh, technology develops uh, much faster and much better uh, than uh, forecasted at a certain point of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that was suggested in earlier sessions at the conference, yeah. actually specifically for TVs. Yes, and uh, Carson, do you want to maybe react to uh, the prices that you saw for the dishwashers, um, that really only the high price dishwashers um, can reach the most efficient classes? Uh, and how does this compare to uh, the results that Sophie Attali showed that suggested specifically for the German market that manufacturers are able to market the best, most efficient products at higher prices? Well, well yeah, this is somehow speculative, but uh, of course it could be that, that there's a price premium, of course, a more energy efficient device because for the PR, for the marketing, it's uh, really important uh, somehow really to, to come to an upper label and uh, upper class and uh, this actually is the consumer is willing also to, to pay uh, for that to a certain extent. Um, 
but are we, I, I can't distinguish whether, whether this is just a price premium due to the better energy efficiency class or due to technological reasons in the background that it's really so much uh, more costly uh, to produce uh, such kind of energy efficient classes. Uh, I rather would doubt that uh, the latter is the case to the extent uh, shown in the statistics. Mm -hmm. Uh, Thomas, can you help me? Are there any questions that I missed? Um, listeners, if you have anything more posted now, because otherwise I'm going to slowly close this session. Um, it well, okay, let's, um, we already discussed uh, 10 minutes longer than uh, scheduled. So thank you everybody for this. Um, and uh, just to mention, there's two informal sessions in the afternoon. Uh, oh, there's two sessions at 4.15 p.m. Um, in the meeting mode, so you can have discussions. One is exploration of how sound and visualization can lead to a renewed connection to the energy system. And the other is looking at urban net zero and renewable energy commitments during COVID-19. And at 6 p.m. is the summer study party. Um, and so check the agenda for these later events. Um, and for panel nine, we have one last session tomorrow, uh, which promises to be really interesting. And some of my favorite uh, presentations are in there. So check this one out. It's a bit of an outlook how product policy uh, is becoming more digital, more environmental, and more system oriented. So. Thank you again for joining today. Thank you so much to all the speakers. And goodbye. Have a good day. Thanks as well. Bye. 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 Bye.